Wednesday at 9 on MSNBC. Hey everyone, I'm Allison Morris. Welcome to our special coverage of the Democratic debate hosted by MSNBC and The Washington Post at the Tyler Perry Studios in Atlanta, Georgia. Tonight on NBC News Now, the fifth Democratic primary debate. The stage is set in Atlanta, and the DNC has narrowed tonight's field to 10 candidates who hit higher polling and fundraising thresholds to qualify. Of those 10, there's a pretty clear top tier of four candidates who will be standing center stage. Former Vice President Joe Biden, who's still in the lead in most national polls, Massachusetts Senator Elizabeth Warren, Vermont Senator Bernie Sanders, and South Bend, Indiana Mayor Pete Buttigieg. Six other candidates also in the stage will be fighting to break into that top tier. Buttigieg will likely have a target on his back tonight. Recent polls in Iowa and New Hampshire show him as the new front runner in those early voting states, making the 37-year-old mayor the rising candidate of the moment. He's been positioning himself as an alternative to Joe Biden for moderates who aren't excited about the former VP. But Buttigieg has some enthusiasm problems of his own, particularly among non-white voters who will have more of a say after Iowa and New Hampshire. There have also been some changes to the field since the last debate. Some familiar faces didn't qualify tonight, namely former Housing Secretary Julian Castro, who's been in all of the debates so far and is still actively campaigning. Former Democratic Congressman of Texas Beto O'Rourke dropped out of the race, but former Massachusetts Governor Deval Patrick jumped in and there's buzz building around a possible run from former New York City Mayor Michael Bloomberg. Neither of them will be on stage tonight, though. Tonight, 10 Democratic candidates are making their case on the debate stage in Atlanta. Savannah Sellers is there and she joins me live. Savannah, great to see you. You've been in Atlanta a couple of days now. Give us the lay of the land. Tell us what it's like out there. Hey, Allison, happy to be with you. Thanks for having me. So that's right, I've been here a couple days now, and we are right now in the media center here on the Tyler Perry Studios. So this is actually really cool that we're on an actual soundstage in the middle of a movie lot. There's a fake White House just about a block away, which is pretty fitting for tonight. There's fake yachts, fake mansions. It's actually very cool as opposed to those universities or performing arts centers that a lot of times these debates are at. So that's what it's like here. The media center is just starting to fill up. Of course, we're about an hour from the debate. So it's just starting to get exciting here, Allison. Savannah, tell us a little bit about what prep's been like for these candidates over the past couple days. Right, so every day is prep, right? Every candidate, yeah. every voter, excuse me, that they're talking to, every chance that they have to be having these appearances where they're sharpening their talking points on the policies that they're going to have to touch on tonight. Now, according to our NBC News embeds, who I've been talking with the last two or three days, have been really specific prep about this debate tonight. Just like you mentioned, with Mayor Pete Buttigieg surging, at, surging ahead in Iowa and New Hampshire, there's lots of specific prep focused on that. But every day is pretty much prep, and the bar is set really high tonight. As you know, it was a little bit tougher to get into this debate there had to have, have at least 3% in at least four polls and at least 165,000 individual donors. So tough to get here, as you know, for those 10 candidates. Savannah, what's the vibe like there right now? We know they've done this four times already. Are the teams relaxed? Are they getting a little nervous now that we're getting down to the hour before? Right. As you just said, this is the fifth debate. So, of course, there's that pre-big event type of yeah. energy that you'd have anywhere. But given that this is the fifth debate, I think people are a little bit more confident. And also, there is no one on the stage tonight where this is their first debate. You know, think back to the first debate. Andrew Yang, not a politician, has never been on a debate stage before. Or last time at the October debate, that was Tom Steyer's first time in this cycle being on the stage. So for no one, this is their first time. So they're feeling a little bit better, we think. Savannah, can you run us through just some of the rules of the debate tonight, what we can sort of expect the layout to be for, uh, when we get started at 9 o'clock? Absolutely. So they will have 75 seconds to answer a question, 45 seconds for follow-up at the moderator's discretion. Also, if their name is mentioned by another candidate, they should be able to respond again at the moderator's discretion. There will be no opening statements, but they'll have a minute and 15 seconds for a closing statement. And something that's also interesting to note, the plan that was announced is that they are hoping to ask an equal number of questions to each of the candidates to minimize that sizable difference in speaking time that we've seen, like in October when Elizabeth Warren spoke for about 23 minutes minutes, while Tom Steyer spoke for just over seven minutes, so they're trying to minimize that gap this time around. All right, we'll keep an eye out for that balance. Awesome to see you, Savannah. Thank you so much for being with us. Thanks, Allison. 
It has been 27 years since a Democratic presidential nominee won a general election in Georgia. That was Bill Clinton back in 1992. But Democrats think they have a shot in 2020. So what issues will dominate the stage tonight as they make their case to be the party's nominee? Let's get into it. Here with me tonight, MSNBC political analyst and senior director of progressive programming for Sirius XM, Serlina Maxwell, Republican strategist and co-host of Vox Media's Consider It, Sir Michael Singleton, and Washington Post reporter Jackie Alimany. Thank you all for being here, guys. So happy to have you. Uh, Zerlina, let's start with you. Former VP Biden, Bernie Sanders, Elizabeth Warren have consistently topped national polls, but a new poll shows that Mayor Pete is surging in Iowa. We're also seeing him ahead in another poll in New Hampshire. Can we expect to see a target on his back tonight? Yes. And I think um, in some ways that's a good thing because anybody mm -hmm. who rises to the top of this field, this large field, um, should be able to handle attacks coming from their fellow Democratic candidates, whether it come, be, whether it come on policy positions they currently hold or plans they want to do in the future mm -hmm. or their records. And I think with Mayor Pete, um, he has to answer for the fact that he does not have a good record with black people in South Bend, Indiana. And I think some of that is translating to his lack of black support. He has one poll, one, Quinnipiac, where he's at 4%. In most of the other polls, he's at zero or one. And so to be fair, he's at four in the one poll, but mostly he's a zero. Yeah. yeah. And so he's not registering with black voters. And there's a all. reason for that. One is lack of experience, but the other I think is he doesn't have the record to stand on. Even if he didn't have the experience, like say he is a South Bend mayor, all the circumstances are still the same, but he had a good solid record. Mm -hmm. Black people would give him a serious consideration but if you don't have any record to stand on, that's, gonna, that's a hard case yeah. to make. And we are going to delve even deeper into the black vote a little bit later in our show. Definitely stick around for that. Jackie, I want to ask you, Medicare for All has triggered some of the most heated debates we have seen so far. Do you expect health care to be a big issue tonight? Or is there something else that you say, no, they're going to shift here instead? It's undoubtedly going to be a big issue because it is the top issue for voters, as multiple polls have said throughout this election. Uh, and it's a really interesting issue because I think it captures the larger debate that's going on in the Democratic Party right now, which is, you know, do candidates want a more moderate, pragmatic candidate? Do voters want a more mm -hmm. moderate, pragmatic candidate? Or do they want someone with who wants change, bold, progressive reforms? Do they want Bernie Sanders, Elizabeth Warren, or do they want Buttigieg or Joe Biden? And for the first time, Elizabeth Warren's going to be on the debate stage actually having to defend a a plan that she put out herself of how to finance her Medicare for All plan. So it also provides an opportunity for Bernie Sanders to attack Elizabeth Warren for the first time. They've generally been mm -hmm. ideologically aligned, but Warren has gotten blowback from some progressives about this two-stage implementation process. Uh, and, you know, yeah. Mayor Pete and Joe Biden have attacked Warren for her financing plan, which right. says claims to make no middle-class cuts. She's undoubtedly going to be attacked um, by them because, you know, after she released this plan, it was actually the first time she did see a decline in the polls and and Buttigieg spiked. So it looks like Buttigieg won't be the only one under attack tonight. <laughs> sure, Michael, let me ask you this. Georgia, a deeply Republican state. Yep. Democrats are hoping to change that. What do they need to do on the stage tonight to change that? And what will it mean for 2020 if they're able to flip voters in this state? I mean, what you're beginning to see is that the electoral maps are changing. And mm -hmm. you saw this in 2018 with Stacey Abrams. Mm -hmm. um, African Americans played a critical role, not only in Atlanta, but in southern parts of Georgia like Macon, Georgia, Savannah, Georgia. And so what you're beginning to see is that the demographics of these three very heavy cities or large cities, I sh should say, are beginning to dictate the direction that the state is going. And so I would predict, if not by 2020, possibly by 2024, Georgia will be purple, if not leaning blue. And that should be a concern uh, for Republicans. But I think as it pertains to tonight, mm -hmm. uh, Mayor Pete obviously will be the target. And I would tell people, remember, at some point, Joe Biden was number one in Iowa. Elizabeth Warren was number one in Iowa. And while people don't trust polls, the polls have been consistent about one thing. While you may be at the top today, you could be at the bottom tomorrow. Exactly. Mayor Pete should be mindful of that. Things can change real <laughs> fast. All right, we've got two new faces in the Democratic race. We have mentioned they're not going to be here tonight, but uh, former Massachusetts Governor Deval Patrick officially in. Yep. Mayor Bloomberg hedging his bets a little bit, but come on, everyone's expecting him to get in the race, yeah. right? They will not be here tonight, but what does this entry mean for the Democrats? How will this maybe be the elephant in the room tonight? I just have to say, I think it's interesting that everybody waited for the woman to be in first before they were like, hmm, I think I'm going to jump in now. Pretty, um, no shade. Um, I, I just wanted to maybe point... Just, maybe just the slightest bit of shade, Just a little Zalina. shade, but I just wanted shade. to point okay. that out. Because, you know, they didn't jump in when Biden was up by 20 points. They waited until Elizabeth Warren was in first, but um, that's neither here nor there. The point is, is that every single person running for this nomination, um, no matter where they are in the standings, is going 
going to have to bring it. Right. Um, I think the fact that people are jumping in this late is actually a reflection of the weakness of President Trump as an incumbent president. That's why you have 100 people running, because if he can be the president and he's at 30 percent approval, well, then why not run now? Because you're going to have a much uh, higher chance of winning potentially the nomination of becoming president in this set of circumstances versus if there were, was a stronger incumbent president in the White House that wasn't currently currently being impeached. Sure, Michael I gave you a, I, I, I have a I, I feeling you have a different opinion on this one. Let's hear it. I certainly do. I think this, this indicates that there is concern among a certain class of Democrats Rich people. that that, Rich donors. The, that the current pool of candidates not do not have what it takes to defeat Donald Trump. I think they see Joe Biden as a very weak front run, runner, and they see potential for Elizabeth Warren to potentially gain the nominee. And the concern is that many of her positions and pronouncements cannot win in certain parts of the country. And then I think there's also a concern mm -hmm. that if she were to win, she's promising things that she could not legislatively accomplish. But I think that's two two different points. I think <laughs> well, because I actually, and I think Jackie might have a third point over here. Well, I, yeah, yeah, I, well, I agree. <laughs> with the second point that she's putting out bold plans and prog a progressive vision mm -hmm. that with the filibuster and Mitch McConnell is nearly impossible to accomplish. She has talked about getting rid of the filibuster and a path forward to getting those things done, but with the way things set up are set up now, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's very difficult, basically impossible to get it done. But the first point you made, though, I do not think that people Here are comes jumping. The shade. I do not. I, 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 I really do not think that the donor class of the Democratic Party is encouraging a Michael Bloomberg or a Deval Patrick to jump in because they think that the Democratic mm -hmm. field is weak against Trump. I think they want to, them to jump in because they do not like the policies that Elizabeth Warren is putting forward that would impact and most of their the Democratic bank Party, accounts which is still directly. Right. I mean, well, the, the Democratic, all right, Jackie, where do you Democratic agree? Democratic where do you disagree? Field, well, the Democratic field. Did not need another billionaire or a former fossil fuel executive. We didn't ask for that. And, <laughs> I, and I do think Zerlina is right. I mean, Elizabeth Warren faces an unfair amount of scrutiny because of her gender, and that, that's undeniable. Uh, she gets called. Don't laugh. She gets. That's true. I, just, I, that's I, funny. I don't. But I also want to say that this also is reflective of the malleability of the field yeah. right now. Yeah. You know, voters are way more undecided about their mm -hmm. candidates and who they favor than they were this summer. Uh, and Mayor Pete's rise is demonstrative of that as well. There is so much volatility. Here, right. people don't know what they want. There's an impeachment investigation going on. People's attention are spread so thin right now that I think that Bloomberg and Patrick also saw an opening here to get in there. But this, you know, this these nerves, mm -hmm. this antsiness is a perennial trend of the Democratic yeah, establishment yeah, absolutely. that happens on a that happens during every election. People get unhappy with their candidates halfway through. They get nervous. They, you know, wet the bed. So. <laughs> when, you're, when, you're, when, you're, when you're working there, you get nervous and you freak out. And, and you wet the bed. Happening. <laughs> so let me ask you guys. I'm going to go down the line. Uh, we talked about who's getting into the race. Let's talk about potentially who might be exiting. We know Castro is not there tonight. His campaign having financial trouble. Uh, Cory Booker's campaign at one point having financial trouble. That was back in September. Uh, we also know Politico had an article last week saying Kamala Harris's campaign is just no discipline, no plan, no strategy. Are those the candidates that you're concerned about, Jack? And let me start with you. And if not, who do you think may be exiting next? Well, there's been a lot of, I think, frustration with the DNC right now because the field and these debate, this mm -hmm. debate stage is still so big mm -hmm. and it feels more like, I think, entertainment rather than people actually learning about the issues and understanding yeah. what's going on. And voters are, are, quite frankly, seem to be a bit confused about the wide array of options. So I do think that, you know, going into the next debate, this is a chance for these fringe candidates to really, they, they need a moment. They, they need a viral moment. They need a good performance in order to, to stay in there and to keep raising money. Um, you know, there's all, there's a, there is a limited amount of money in the yeah. Democratic primary. Who you no, I, I think Cory Booker may not make it, and I think they have to cut these candidates down. We're less than 70 days away from the February 3rd Iowa yeah, caucus. Right. If, if they're not careful, I predict they could get close to a brokered convention, and that's nothing that either party would like Nobody to see. Nobody wants that, yeah. yeah. I think there's a high likelihood of a brokered convention just because of the rules and how they're well, set out in the early too. states yeah. or in the in the primary uh, states where you have to get 15 percent in the state and also in each congressional in order to qualify for to get an apportionment of delegates. Mm -hmm. And I don't think a lot of people are aware of that. So we're going to see a lot of delegates, you know, shared between, yeah. you know, the top two or right. three people. Mm -hmm. right. And that means it'll go longer and longer um, because we have so many candidates. Um, I think that, you know, Cory Bo it's a shame, actually, that Cory Booker and Julian Castro and Kamala Harris are the names we brought up. They also happen to be the candidates of color in this race, and I don't think that's a coincidence. I think that there's a combination mm -hmm. of sort of an implicit bias that we all have um, for looking at a Mayor Pete and saying, wow, he has such potential. Isn't he so excited?
fighting. And then when, when Elizabeth Warren comes with literally a truck full of plans, we're like, oh, well, we need more than plans. We need more than plans. I mean, how are you really going to get all your plans done, right? We want her to show her work, where with him, we're like, wow, we can't wait to see what you can do. And I think that that implicit bias is impacting how people are polling mm -hmm. based, you know, as a result of the coverage that they're getting. So I think it's complicated and nuanced. Yeah. It's unfortunate that the candidates of color are the ones sort of on the fringe sure, here. Sure. All right, guys, we're going to come back to you. Thank you so much for being with us. I know we got a lot to talk about. We absolutely will come back to you. This is Arlena Shermichael uh, and Jackie. Let's go for a moment now to the field of Democrats trying to take on Trump. That keeps shifting. We've been talking about that. We are seeing some surprising surges because of that in the polls. Steve Kornacki explains the state of the race as we head into tonight's debate. The stage for the, the debate tonight obviously will look a little different than the last Democratic debate. The last time, remember, they had 12 candidates there, 12 candidates, one stage, one night. So two of the candidates who were on the stage last time uh, not going to be here tonight. One was Beto O'Rourke. He dropped out of the race. The other, Julian Castro, he didn't hit the polling uh, thresholds that you need to qualify for this debate. Looked like O'Rourke was probably not going to either. So you've got 10 candidates. And then the question is, after tonight, and then a month from now, the next debate, the, the thresholds are going to be even higher for that one. Some of the candidates right now in danger of missing that. You know, Cory Booker comes to mind. Cory Booker, question of whether he'll be there. Also, there's a question with Mike Bloomberg looking at maybe getting in the race with Deval Patrick entering the race a week ago. Uh, will either of them be able to qualify for that next debate uh, a little bit more than a month from now? Bloomberg has indicated that if he does enter, he wouldn't run in Iowa. He wouldn't run in New Hampshire. He wouldn't run in the early states. He would sort of try to jumpstart his candidacy in later states. The calculation, I think, for both of them is simply the main one is they're underwhelmed by the rest of the field. I think they may have both had an assumption that Joe Biden would be the clear far and away front runner at this point. He certainly he entered the race, you know, getting around 40 percent nationally. Now he's maybe in the in the high 20s nationally. Biden looks like he might have some trouble in Iowa, might have some trouble in New Hampshire. The big news is what's happening in the first state, the leadoff state, the Iowa caucuses, the Des Moines Register, the big newspaper out there in Iowa. Their latest poll has Pete Buttigieg not just leading, but leading by nine points. They have met 25 percent, 16 percent. Elizabeth Warren in second place, Biden back at 15. So certainly there's been evidence for a while that Pete Buttigieg has been doing better, significantly better in Iowa than he's been doing nationally. Now I think he's got the lead in Iowa. I think that's safe to say. The question with Buttigieg, I think there's two questions. Number one is, is he peaking too soon? You always ask that when somebody kind of comes out of nowhere to take a lead in a poll. Uh, we still have time to go until the actual caucuses. By taking the lead in the polling out there, what does that mean? It means Buttigieg is going to start getting scrutiny. His rivals are going to start going after him. I think the media is going to start asking more questions, more critical questions. Um, certainly, you look at these uh, these debates, uh, he's probably going to have more of a target on his back. How does he hold up in the face of that scrutiny? Do those numbers hold up? Do they start to slide back? Certainly, there's a history of candidates suddenly going under the microscope and, and looking a little different. So that's the first question with him. The second question with Buttigieg, though, is if he does hold on to the lead in Iowa, if he does win Iowa, what can he do with that? There's certainly a history on the Democratic side of candidates winning Iowa and then rolling and getting momentum from there and getting the Democratic nomination. It doesn't automatically happen. It doesn't always happen. And I think the question with Buttigieg, if he wins Iowa, is we've seen some clear weaknesses for him in polling beyond Iowa, specifically when you get to South Carolina, specifically when you get to African-American voters. Remember, about one out of every four ballots that are cast across the country in Democratic primaries 2020 will come from black voters. Uh, not a lot in Iowa, not a lot in New Hampshire, but more than 60 percent of the electorate in South Carolina, big chunks of the electorate in some other critical states. And, and Buttigieg, for all of the momentum he's shown in Iowa, there's been still no evidence uh, that he's gaining any support with black voters in South Carolina or really anywhere else. That would have to change. So there's a question there whether he's peaking too soon in Iowa. And there's a question of if he holds on in Iowa, does it end up looking like an outlier or could he roll that into other victories? You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. Stand one is at a standstill. Good afternoon from the spin it's room. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays, 3 to 11 p.m. Eastern. 
a very busy news day. Today's high-stakes confrontation. Let's go live the to the border where our colleagues... Exclusive video. You the country's top see. intelligence officials testified. NBC on. News gets an exclusive look inside. Live here at the nation's capital. There's now an open investigation. Blockbuster new reporting today on the... This security. is the deadliest school shooting. The Supreme Court upheld the revised version. Well, this new report comes amid a staggering amount of news. Breaking really. news tonight exclusively here on... NBC on. News was first out with this scoop It's been today. an extraordinary night watching this develop. So, a lot to talk about. We are going to start with something different tonight. This is one of those things that you have not been otherwise hearing about in the news, but stick with me. Feed your mind with fresh perspective. Get your favorite MSNBC shows now as podcasts. All eyes on the 2020 election. Follow the latest on the candidates with the NBC News mobile app. Stay connected with breaking news, top stories, live video, and your favorite NBC News shows. Text NBC News to 66866 to get the app. A very busy news day. Today's high stakes confrontation. Let's go live the to the border where our colleagues. Exclusive video. You the country's top intelligence officials testify. NBC on. News gets an exclusive look inside. Live here at the nation's capital. There's now an open investigation. Blockbuster new reporting today on the This scene. is the deadliest school shooting. The Supreme Court upheld the revised version. Well, this new report comes amid a staggering amount of news. Breaking really. news tonight exclusively here. NBC on. News was first out with this scoop today. It's been today. an extraordinary night watching this develop. So, a lot to talk about. Good evening, everyone. Breaking news tonight. Lester Holt. It sounds like a jet airplane up there, but that is fire. Let's talk about the match. How do you convince some skittish passenger to get on this airplane? We've met a lot of great people. The most trusted TV news anchor in America. That's nightly news. I'm Lester Holt. All eyes on the 2020 election. Follow the latest on the candidates with the NBC News mobile app. Stay connected with breaking news, top stories, live video, and your favorite NBC News shows. Text NBC News to 66866 to get the app. When the facts are hidden in the shadows. When sources go silent because they're risking so much more. When every lead takes you further down a winding trail, but closer to the truth. And the challenge is greater because the stakes are higher. That's when the stories you unearth can shake the world. Exclusive report from NBC News. This is exclusive to us. NBC News is out today with some exclusive new reporting. We are going to start with something different tonight. This is one of those things that you have not been otherwise hearing about in the news, but stick with me. Feed your mind with fresh perspective. Get your favorite MSNBC shows now as podcasts. Washington feels more chaotic than ever. It's my job to ask the tough questions, left and right, and help you make sense of it all. More Americans watch NBC News than any other news organization in the world. U.S. Ambassador to the EU Gordon Sondland testifying in today's public impeachment hearing, saying more bluntly than ever before that there was a quid pro quo between the Trump administration and Ukraine. Chuck Todd explains why Sondland's testimony is so significant and how the impeachment hearings could impact the 2020 race. The Democrats got a simple headline. There was a quid pro quo. Hard stop. Gordon Sondland testified to this. That's the good news for the Democrats. If there's bad news to Sondland's admission, it is simply this. He doesn't provide a lot of receipts. At some point, I think, during the questioning, two plus two equals four, uh, essentially, is what he's saying. He's like, he put it all together. It was obvious that we couldn't get an explanation of what the aid was held up for, and it wasn't for this, and it wasn't for this. And so, again, having a witness simply say it as plainly as he did. Was there a quid pro quo? With regard to the requested White House call and the White House meeting, the answer is yes. And in his opening statement, even having a section called quid pro quo, in that sense, that's a big headline for the Democrats. The Republicans were, were able to introduce enough doubt in this respect. Sondland's the one who said he talked to the president and the pre president specifically said, I want nothing, no quid pro quo. Now, of course, that's what he said in that one phone call. There's other times where he has said other things, but that is an important thing that Republicans have and they hung their hat on it. I think the Democrats have a bit of a, uh, of a challenge here. I think they have to be both mindful of the calendar and at the same time not let the calendar dictate when um, they pull the trigger on, uh, on passing an article of impeachment. So for instance, these hearings right now, I think they've intended to try to wrap every, the public hearings up this week. 
But let's be realistic. Everything we've heard, you suddenly realize, boy, you need John Bolton's testimony. It would be nice to get Mick Mulvaney's testimony. Maybe you need Kurt Volker to come back. Ron Johnson, you know, you start to hear these names and you start to ask yourself, can they finish this investigation and follow every breadcrumb trail where it leads? Or are they going to short circuit it? And I think what Democrats have to be careful of is if it looks like they're rushing to get to impeachment done in order to beat the deadline of the start of the Iowa caucuses, well, then they're doing what they're accusing the president of doing, right, which is putting politics ahead of sort of the government work here. So I think that's the challenge they face. But on the merits here, I think Democrats would be making a mistake if they don't continue to follow this breadcrumb trail because it is only producing more evidence and, frankly, more potential trails to lead them into other places. I think a lot of us thought they weren't going to be able, be able to reveal that much new information. And let's, it, one thing is crystal clear. These hearings have done what they th would hope that they would do, is as testimony has happened, it has pressured others to give testimony, pressured some who gave testimony, like Sunland, to suddenly fix testimony, or at least provide addendums. The Democrats don't necessarily constantly make the case of why he should be thrown out of office. And if you're going to succeed here, right, that why are you pursuing this? Impeachment only has leads to one remedy, if that's where you're pursuing it. So in that case, there is some questions about whether are the, Demo are the Democrats making the best political argument they can make, or are they making the best pure argument they can make, period? And I think that's an open question. All right, that testimony today, some of the most explosive yet in the impeachment inquiry. Those hearings will be hard to ignore on the debate stage tonight. So let's look at the role impeachment could play both tonight and in the 2020 election. I'm joined by Democratic strategist Emily Tish sussman Republican strategist and MSNBC political analyst Susan Del Percio, and MSNBC legal analyst Danny Savalos. Thank you guys for being with us on a, a mega day today from impeachment to the debates. Susan, I'm going to start with you. The supreme goal for every single Democrat on that stage tonight is to beat President Trump. How do they best use the impeachment inquiry to their advantage? I think they talk about Trump's history as using people and in this case government resources to enhance his own political career. Mm -hmm. I think they have to be very narrow and not get too into the weeds in it because it's overwhelming so many other things and it won't differentiate one from the other because they're all going to say yes Donald Trump's horrible and he should be impeached or maybe they, or maybe some of the senators will say no they're just going to be a witness but either way I think they have to really try not to get too much into the weeds on this. All right, so Emily, let me ask you about this. If this impeachment in inquiry heads to the Senate, several of the candidates on the stage will be or could be part of the trial. Polls show that Americans are still divided on impeachment. Do the candidates need to tread lightly here? Oh, I don't think they need to tread lightly. Mm -hmm. I mean, if they if it ends up going into the Senate, I actually think it provides an opportunity for some of the senators to have a moment to show that they actually can be thoughtful and decisive mm -hmm. and come down hard on the president in ways that actually the Kavanaugh hearing had provided for Senator Harris and Booker um, and Klobuchar, actually, in ways that actually could help them because the debate stage has been so narrow, their time is so limited, that it's really been hard for them to differentiate themselves, especially because they're having to respond to questions instead mm -hmm. of asking questions, which can be great moments for them in, in the Senate. Danny, you've been with me, oh God, it seems like weeks now, but it's been about a week or so. Quite a tour, Danny. <laughs> it's been amazing. You covered the impeachment uh, hearings today for us. Did the Democrats make their case today? It's, it's hard to say. Depending on who you ask, some Republicans mm -hmm. thought that Gordon Sondland was such an unreliable witness mm -hmm. that his testimony was anything but blockbuster. But Democrats would point out that this was the connection to Donald Trump. Witnesses before, maybe they operated on hearsay, maybe they didn't know all the facts, but Gordon Sondland, Democrats will say, knew uh, President Trump personally, had communications with him, and he's changed his testimony to more fit what the Democrats' theory of the case is. And to be specific, mm -hmm. Gordon Sondland now says there was a quid pro quo. But Democrats don't rejoice yet because a quid pro quo is not necessarily a complete admission of responsibility of something wrong. As many Republicans have taken the position, there are many quid pro quos in foreign policy. And you have to ask, well, wait, was this a quid pro quo for an investigation of corruption generally? Was it a Burisma? And if it was a Burisma, the company, does that mean it's just as bad as an investigation of Hunter Biden? And if it's of Hunter Biden, is that still something that the president may have the authority to do? Anything you would have wanted either the Democrats or the Republicans to do differently today? 
Well, but that's a tough question. Uh, <laughs> anything to do? How much time do you have? Whatever, whatever the Republicans did, the Democrats did the mirror opposite right. of it. But I, I have to say there were a couple inconsistencies I mm -hmm. wanted to figure out. And to put it very briefly, Kurt Volker said when he got the directive, go talk to Rudy Giuliani. They took it like, ah, you know, he's saying if you don't believe me, ask Rudy Giuliani. Then today you hear a completely different story. You're Sondland saying, no, that was a direct order. That was like Colonel Jessup and a few good men. I ordered the code red. Go do it. When I give an order, an order is followed. And that was a discrepancy I felt like I didn't get a lot of explanation for him. But I kind of wonder, like, you have the legal point of view, which I wouldn't even think about disagreeing with. But <laughs> on the do. political, on the, well, I'm not a lawyer, but, um, but on, the, on the political scope, I think at the end of the day, the problem is, is nothing's changed. I think that for the President Trump will be impeached. I don't. As of now, I have not seen something that would cause 20 Republican senators to vote to remove him from office. They right now, the argument will move to, okay, so we did it. And, right. and, and that, so, so we did it. Now, we may all think, or I don't want to speak for anyone, like, that's a really bad thing he did, yeah. if he, especially if he admits it. Like, that's really bad, and he shouldn't be serving. But, and more people will say there's just, a, there's an election in less than a year. Why not let it, the voters decide? They put him in, let them take him out. But Chuck Todd did say something interesting on that segment before. He said, will they continue to follow the breadcrumbs? And I think because the outcome right now is so cut and dry, they should keep following the breadcrumbs because that can potentially change the outcome. Let's not forget, when it came to Bill Clinton, that investigation started about a real estate deal. It ended in a blue dress. You don't know where these <laughs> go. But I will tell you where I actually think did change it. It's two words. It's Kentucky and Louisiana. That Trump oh. went full in to, to campaign for the Republican governor can, gubernatorial candidates there, and they still lost. And I think oh. that's the bigger deal for the senators, not the fact that they have already, like, they've made their bet. They've tied themselves to him. They are saying among themselves. They are saying to reporters. They have not heard anything that changes their opinion that makes them think that what he did mm -hmm. was unseemly. Well, anyone who thinks we, that Donald Trump is there, is going to use his coattails to help someone else, hasn't been watching with the results. I agree. All right, we got to wrap it there, guys, but keep following the breadcrumb seems to be the takeaway today. Thank you so much, Emily, Susan, and Dan. We appreciate it, guys. Kent County, Michigan voted for Obama in 2008, Romney in 2012, and Trump in 2016. It is the kind of swing county that could be key in determining who wins the next election. Dasha Burns is at a watch party there for tonight's debate. Dasha, Michigan, an important swing state that was blue since 1992 until Trump turned it red in 2016. You talked with some Republicans this week who are on the fence about the president. Now you're with Democrats. How are those conversations different? Hey, Allison. Yeah, I'm at a gathering of uh, Kent County Democrats here. It's a pretty rowdy group behind me gearing up to watch this debate. Look, I have to say I was pretty surprised because the national narrative, right, is that Democrats and Republicans right now could not be farther apart. But here, it's a pretty different story. And in fact, the differences that I've heard between the Democrats that I've talked to and the, or the Republicans I've talked to aren't very many. Everyone I talk to seems to say, look, we we want someone reasonable. We want someone who can be the adult in the room. Um, I've heard uh, both Democrats and Republicans here say they're fans of Buttigieg and they want to hear uh, more from him tonight. Uh, they're interested in, in what Joe Biden has to say. They're a little skeptical of candidates like Warren and Sanders who um, they don't know if they can necessarily pay for everything that they're talking about. Um, but let me bring in uh, Cynthia Timmerman. Come on in with me here. Um, Cynthia is actually, funnily enough, one of the first voters that I talked to uh, when, when we first got here tonight. And Cynthia uh, had voted for Republicans her entire life until 2016. Um, and now uh, she actually told me earlier that she's still registered as a Republican, but only because she can't quite figure out how to change her registration. Now, Cynthia, let me ask you, if five or 10 years ago, someone told you that in 2019, you'd be at a local gathering of Democrats, would you be surprised? I would have been floored. There is no way I would have ever imagined that. So why are you here tonight? At this point, the Dems values are aligning mostly with mine, and um, I've just not been happy with Mr. Trump and the way that he has managed our budget, that he has um, uh, portrayed us to the world, um, and, and many of his budget, or many of his other policies.
policies have rubbed me the wrong way, um, immigration, education, the whole bit. Now, clearly you're uncomfortable with what the Trump administration has done, but what would it take, what do these candidates need to bring to the table to actually get you very excited to vote for a Democrat? What do they need to do to win over voters like you? They need to tell me how they're going to pay for things. Uh, everyone can have a great idea. Not everyone can tell me how they're going to pay for them, uh, what the sacrifices are going to be, whether it be higher taxes, whether it be we need to give up some programming, um, scale it back on some other things. I really want to know that fiscal angle to what they are proposing to us. Um, and a track record also helps, you know. If, if we've heard of them before, we can go back and we can look at what they've been doing. Um, we do have some newcomers that are, are attractive. Um, okay, let's talk a little bit more about their understanding of the fiscal responsibilities that they will also be facing. Thank you so much, Cynthia. So, um, Allison, here in Kent County, voters are, are paying a lot of attention to what's going on. They know they're in an important state, in an important county, and that their vote is really going to matter. And so they, they want to hear what everyone has to say. Most people I've talked to still aren't fully decided or, or fully gung-ho on any one given candidate. So they're open and then they'll be listening. Dasha, thank you so much. Great to see you, and thanks for being with us. New Hampshire voters notoriously independent. The state is a large block of undeclareds, people who aren't registered Republicans or Democrats. So where do those voters stand? Alexa Leoto is live now from New Hampshire. Alexa, what are voters on the ground there telling you? Hey, Allison, lots of different viewpoints here. We're actually at a debate watch party in a bar with some unaffiliated voters, definitely some unaffiliated voters and some undeclared voters, but people are definitely watching the debates tonight to figure out what the candidates have to say and whether that resonates with them. But I've heard repeatedly in New Hampshire that one of the benefits about being here is really the ability to spend time with the candidates, really understand their policy proposals, um, and that'll definitely, definitely impact how they're looking at, at the debate tonight, just hearing what the candidates have to say and uh, not needing to declare an affiliation with a party until kind of the, the last minute. So I'm actually with two unaffiliated voters right now, Jordan and Emily. Jordan, you are a registered Democrat, but you are switching. You yeah. are going to re-register as an undeclared and independent voter. So what, why choose to be an undeclared voter? So I'm an independent voter because I think that our two-party system is not working for our generation. Uh, both parties, Democrats and Republicans alike, have unfortunately been bought out by corporations and special interests. So I'd rather be independent um, and stick more to the issues. Talking about the issues, and Emily, feel free to jump in. What are some of the issues that you're hoping the candidates talk about tonight? What are some of the issues that really matter to you both? So one of the issues that really matters to me is Medicare for All, because as a young voter, like as long as I can remember, um, health insurance companies have been that have been profiting off of people dying, basically, from not being able to afford health care. And that's like an issue that's really important to me. So it sounds like you're pretty decided on voting Democrat. Why do you an undeclared vote? So it's really the same thing as Jordan. Like, um, like it's really hard to tell like the difference between the parties at this point. Um, and it's just, again, I'm mainly focused on the issues at hand, which is, again, why I haven't chose one party or the other. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. For me, I'm looking for a candidate that has a strong Green New Deal plan because for decades before I was even born, fossil fuel executives have profited off of knowingly poisoning our air, water, and communities. And they've been, then used that money to lobby politicians and deceive the public about climate change. So that's sort of an example of how both parties, um, you know, have done that. Um, and so, you know, that bothers me. Are there any candidates that are going to be on the debate stage tonight that you that are a definite no for you guys? Ooh, that's so good. with Medicare for All, with me, like Joe Biden and Pete Buttigieg, um, they don't they really they don't support Medicare for All, and to me that's a big red flag because, like again, like I've seen people like in the community either get more sick or die from not being able to afford health care, and I just want a candidate who has a really clear plan for that, so that way like people can get the health care because it's a human right. Yeah. 
Yeah, I've actually recently been working with my close friend who is an asylum seeker from Nicaragua, and we're trying to figure out whether he can get Medicaid, and we don't know. The, the, you know, the process is extremely tedious, and if he can't get that access to Medicaid, he's going to have to go through the market, uh, which means he's going to have high deductibles, high premiums, co-pays. Healthcare is a human right and should be awarded to everybody. All right. For me, uh, you know, Joe Biden, speaking of Joe Biden, not only does he not support a Green New Deal, but he's in fact working with a super PAC. That means that the very people that are profiting uh, from this climate crisis, they could be contributing to Joe Biden's campaign. That's absolutely absurd. We need a candidate that is transparent and honest, and for me, that's Bernie Sanders. Jordan, Emily, thank you so much for sharing. Allison, we will be keeping close tabs on some of the undecided or unaffiliated voters here in New Hampshire as the night continues. Allison? All right, Alexa, thank you so much. The black vote's an extremely important voting bloc for the Democratic Party. It'll be hard for any of tonight's candidates to win the Democratic nomination without it. Democratic strategist Basil Smichel walks us through how some of the candidates are trying to connect with black voters. So we saw Mike Bloomberg apologize for his policy on stop and frisk, which um, I think he certainly needed to do. I didn't understand that back then, the full impact that stops were having on the black and Latino communities. I don't know that that wins him any African-American votes from the other Democratic candidates running, certainly not Joe Biden. I think one of the strategies he may want to employ if he's looking to get uh, votes from African Americans is try to uh, get some, uh, siphon away some of the support from the second and lower tier candidates. But uh, there are so many um, individuals in the black community, Latino community, particularly among black men, who are very upset at him. Uh, for his uh, stop and frisk policy and that it has taken this long uh, to to apologize for it. So Joe Biden has used successfully um, his role as vice president to say, I had a seat uh, next to this historic president. I was key in defending him against people like Donald Trump through the birtherism controversy. Uh, and, and I think for older African-Americans, because his, his black support does skew older, Joe Biden, for all of his, uh, I think, problems with policies like uh, criminal justice um, has been a party person. And I think the familiarity with him over that time, I think has garnered him a lot of um, support, particularly from these older black voters. So you saw in the last debate, uh, Pete Buttigieg really go after Elizabeth Warren. Your signature, Senator, is to have a plan for everything except this. And I think that paid off for him in some respects. But he does have this problem uh, attracting uh, support from African-American voters, if not f just for the fact that he famously now fired uh, the black police chief in South Bend. There was a report some uh, weeks ago that a lot of South Carolina voters had an issue with the fact that he was gay. I don't know that they view his candidacy as problematic because of that. They just don't know him. I think his support um, in Iowa is seems to be really strong. I wonder how sustainable it will be. He's talked about some issues that would impact the communities of color, particularly on uh, uh, credit scores and housing and education. Uh, but there's still there's still a lot of time, and he still needs to make substantial inroads in those communities. Kamala Harris is a very interesting case here because. While she has put to rest some of the concerns about her record as a prosecutor, I think that lingered in the, in the minds of a, a tremendous number of voters, particularly within the black community. And this is important to note that the black vote is not monolithic. Black voters don't automatically get behind the black candidate, but you still need to show some engagement and some strength in the community. And I think that record uh, that she's had uh, as a prosecutor, it has stuck with her and I think hurt her in the community. Black voters, rather than being monolithic, are actually very savvy. They're very pragmatic and understand not just the nuances of winning, but also uh, are looking for opportunities to gain political and economic power through their vote. So it's not a monolithic vote, but it is a savvy vote and it is a nuanced vote. Um, I don't want to see black votes uh, take a backseat to electability, which over time is just incredibly difficult to define. And no front runner uh, in the race so far, to me, 
has done exceptional in terms of their outreach to black voters. And that, I think, is something worth looking at as we go forward. Pete Buttigieg is in first place in some new polls in both Iowa and New Hampshire, but Buttigieg has a big issue in South Carolina. We alluded to this before. A poll there gives him zero support from black voters. This is a state with a population that is almost a third black. MSNBC political analyst Zerlina Maxwell is back. So is Republican strategist Sure Michael Singleton. Thank you both for staying with us. Zerlina, we touched on this before. I'm going to start with you. You have been vocal for a while yes. about Mayor Pete's failures to connect with the black voters. That Carolina poll proving your point. Why is he struggling? You touched on this before, but also what does he need to do and can he change that? I think it's a combination of a, a number of different things. One, he's a new face, mm -hmm. right? And mm -hmm. he's this mayor of a small town where he won his reelection with 8,000 votes. And so I think, you know, he has a lot of introducing, not just to black voters, but to all voters. Mm -hmm. He's been doing a good job, I think, so far of mm -hmm. doing that with voters in Iowa and New Hampshire. The problem for Mayor Pete is that the majority of the voters, 90% plus in both of those states are white. And so once you get to South Carolina, mm -hmm. there literally is, and Bernie Sanders discovered this in 2016, mm -hmm. that there is a wall of black people that will stop you in your tracks unless you are right. engaging them directly. And I think that part of his problem is, again, going back to our first uh, segment, mm -hmm. um, his record on those issues mm -hmm. is poor. He fired the first black police chief in South Bend. He hasn't handled that issue particularly well. In addition, he just had a new scandal where he put out, a, I think, a substantive and good plan called the Douglas Plan yep. for black America. I think that is a great first step. The problem is, is that they went a little bit too ahead of their skis on that. Mm -hmm. They emailed 400 South Carolina, right. uh, black, black stakeholders yep. in South Carolina, um, basically giving them only hours to opt out of endorsing the plan. When they didn't opt out, they put their name on a list of endorsers, and yeah. several of them <laughs> have come, going on come here, forward yeah. to say, sure. I didn't right. endorse right. this plan. And in addition, they used a stock photo from Kenya yeah. to go along with the press release of the plan. So those are unforced errors, unfortunately, yeah, a couple in a moment, there, ones, yep. in, in a space where you actually need to be perfect because you don't have any support in, in the black community and you need to gain traction there. So I Putting stock photos from Kenya is not a good way to do yeah. that. Definitely yeah, something they will not do again, <laughs> we hope. Sure, Michael, let me not. ask you this, because Zerlina alluded to it, that, look, he just isn't someone that's been around for a while. Mm -hmm. Buttigieg has alluded to this. He said, look, yes, the black voters, they are aligning with Joe Biden, but it's a familiarity thing. He is sure. familiar to them. Do you think that that's a fair assessment? No, I don't think it's a fair assessment. And Zerlina talked about Daryl Boykins, who was the first African-American police chief in South mm -hmm. Bend. Mm -hmm. After Mayor Pete was sworn in, one of his first duties as mayor was was to ask for his resignation. He asked for his resignation because Mr. Boykin, and following with a departmental rule, was wiretapping several police officers who were using racially insensitive words about African Americans, including him. And so Mayor Pete used the excuse that, well, I was receiving pressure from federal prosecutors and I had to ask for your resignation. Mr. Boykin and his attorney didn't believe that, so he rescinded his right. resignation. He right. sued South Bend on discrimination charges and actually won, right. which tells me that Mayor Pete's reasoning for firing him was not legitimate. Right. Number two, there was a police shooting in June where a white officer shot an African-American right. male. I will never forget one particular moment where an African-American woman says to Mayor Pete, why should we vote for you. You want our vote and you're not handling this properly. His reply, I'm not asking for your vote. If you can't deal with racial issues in a town as small as South Bend, why should African Americans believe you're capable across the entire country? And I get he's number one in Iowa right now, but Iowa's the fourth whitest state in America. Winning in Iowa is like winning in New Zealand. It's not representative. <laughs> of America. Oh, look, it's just gonna, not. I was going to ask you this because we consider Iowa and New Hampshire, right, our bellwether yeah, states. We but do. like They're bellwether states for white voters. Right. Where right. should people be looking? What are the states you say, look here, because this is more representative of the demographic today? I think that South Carolina is going to begin mm -hmm. to show us really what the top tier really looks like. Really looks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it's, it's going to show us who those top five folks are mm -hmm. for real. And then you have Nevada coming up mm -hmm. fourth. That's also going to be a good indicator. And like I said earlier, it's a shame that Julian Castro is not gaining more traction because there are later states like Nevada, like uh, the Texas. states that are on Super Tuesday, mm -hmm. um, a lot of those southern states. Um, are more beneficial in terms of the demographics mm -hmm. for these candidates of color that are speaking directly to those communities. Because, you know, as much as we talk about Trump's base or those 70,000 voters in the Midwest in diners who mm -hmm. flipped from Obama to Trump, right. we don't talk about the black people, the million 
voters, mm -hmm. black voters, who did not vote in 2016, yep. that voted yeah. in 2012. And that's the reason why Hillary Clinton is not the president. And those voters are the ones that any of these candidates need to ensure come out next year to vote. Otherwise, the Democrat, whoever it is, no, they're not going to win. Yeah, I guys. Agree. Thank you both so much for being here with us on a bunch of topics. An exciting night. We're actually talking about something other than impeachment. We've got a debate. Thank you, Zelina and Shermichael. Love having you both. And ahead of the big debate tonight, NBC's campaign embed spoke to the Democrats to see how they plan to make their case to voters. Check it out. Well, I want them to really picture what America is going to need that first day after Donald Trump leaves office. What is going to mean for us to uh, get big things done together, to unify a country that's never going to agree on everything, but needs to be able to sustain those working majorities, to do something about climate change, to fix our democracy, to deliver an economy that works for more of us, to conquer racial inequality in this nation. Uh, I'll be laying out how I believe that can be done and looking forward to yet another opportunity to share that. So we think that the first hour of the debate should be devoted to shitty baskets. <laughs> and then the second half might be to ask why it is that the United States is the only major country on earth not to guarantee health care to all people when the insurance companies and the drug companies made $100 billion in profit last year. And I'm practicing. I know that NBC is interested in ratings, are they not? And they understand that basketball will get them a lot larger viewing audience, you know, than the 18th debate. That I'm the best candidate to defeat Donald Trump and that I'm best qualified to walk in on day one and serve as president and commander in chief. I look forward to telling them why. I'm very different from all the other candidates. That I have a different background, that I'm an outsider, that I have over a decade of experience of putting together coalitions of Americans to take on and beat what I think of as the unchecked corporate power in this country. I'm going to be leaning on the American people to continue. If you want me in this race, if you want my voice on a debate stage that, frankly, has needed it, has needed it, I believe that we cannot have a, a primary where Democrats are, are distinguishing yourself on primary, on, on your policy differences is important, but tearing down people uh, uh, and the character of people is just unacceptable. I'm going to continue to stand on the debate stage and advocate for my positions, my ideas, my spirit, and I'm going to continue to t call it like it is, that we have one shot to make Donald Trump a one-term president. And tearing each other down is not going to be accomplishing that. We are just moments away from the fifth Democratic debate in Atlanta. Tonight could be the last chance for some contenders to give their campaign some momentum. Let's get some final thoughts before those candidates get to it. For one last time tonight, MSNBC political analyst and senior director of progressive programming for Sirius XM, Zerlina Maxwell, Republican strategist and co-host of Vox Media's considerate Shermichael Singleton, and Washington Post reporter Jackie Alamany. Thank you all for being here, guys. We've Thanks. loved having you. I'd love to get your final thoughts. If we could sort of do a round robin. Jackie, since you're back, what are you looking for? tonight who do you have your eyes on uh, you know who are who are the people you're focusing on this evening I, I'm focused on Mayor Pete. Low-hanging fruit here, but, you know, this is the first time I think he's going to be facing some serious scrutiny, that his plans are going to be under scrutiny, and that uh, candidates are actually going to be attacking him. I think he's been able to evade the spotlight in a way because he's sort of been just below mm -hmm. that top tier, and this is the first time that I think people are going to come out swinging against him. So I'm curious to see how he handles it and how he handles some of the criticisms of yeah. some of his policies and the way he's handled certain events in South Bend. Yeah. And all eyes on Mayor Pete. I would agree. And I actually would like to see what Kamala Harris and some of her mm -hmm. attacks potentially on Mayor Pete, because I think there's an interesting opportunity for her to target him as a front runner in Iowa to say, hey, wait a minute, we get he's doing well here, but there's a much bigger demo group beyond mm -hmm. Iowa and New Hampshire. And we as Democrats need to be cognizant of that. And so it'll be interesting to see if that actually takes place. Serlina? I'm looking at Kamala Harris because right before uh, this debate is getting started, she put out a new ad that was pretty hard hitting. She literally says um, in the ad, and in the tweet that she put out, I prosecuted sex predators, he is one, mm -hmm. about President Trump. Yeah. And so she basically is snatching the wig off you know, anybody Ouch. Ouch. Um, that comes for her. So I'm really looking forward to see if she brings it tonight, but also Mayor Pete is going to be the target now that he's the, f the front runner in Iowa and New Hampshire. And so let's see if he has 
the thick skin to be able to defend off uh, those attacks. How about the issues? Do you guys think that uh, there is impeachment fatigue, that people are tired of hearing about it, or should the Democrats get into that tonight? No, I don't, I don't think they should. I mean, obviously, you're going to have to mention it, right, because mm -hmm. it's all over the news, but I would stick to issues, and stick to issues that you think are are winnable issues, energizes the base, but also issues that you legislatively know you can accomplish. That's what I think voters want to hear. Is there a number one that you say hit healthcare, this? Healthcare, yep. healthcare, absolutely. Okay. After healthcare. today, though, I mean, I, I actually have just a different view as a Democrat. I feel like we've seen the healthcare debate four times. So mm -hmm. as somebody, that's, I mean, I'm more plugged in than the average Democrat, I would imagine. Um, just but a bit. We, we've seen the nuanced debate about the the different uh, details and healthcare plans. Essentially, what the Democratic Party is voting for is someone that we trust on a value base to go in and start negotiations. So we want to start farther left than we did with the public option because we didn't end up with the public option. If you start with Medicare for all, you go into the room and you ne negotiate with Republicans because you know how laws are made, um, you may end up with one if you start further to the left. So I think, you know, I've seen that health care debate. I actually want to hear about impeachment. I want to hear about um, what we just saw and if some of these candidates can come out and almost recap for those Americans that perhaps missed some of the major moments from this morning's hearing, I think that they would be very, I, I think it would benefit their individual candidacies that they would do that. Jackie, you're nodding your head. You want to hear about impeachment tonight? Yeah, before you even ask that question, I was going to say I'm really curious to see how the candidates approach this because we haven't heard all that much from them on the campaign trail about the impeachment inquiry, and I think it's going to be very telling, you know, what they think voters want to hear about the inquiry and the way that they discuss it. But in light of the Harvard IOP poll coming out this week about young voters, I also do want to hear about climate change. It's mm -hmm. a voter that young, yeah. Yeah. It's, a, it's an issue that young voters do really care about it. it's in their top three the economy health care climate change and I hope that we spend a little bit more time talking about it uh, than we have in previous debates and I would just add if you look at the top five issues for voters particularly independent mm -hmm. voters which are a crucial block in, in key swing states Iowa New Hampshire Michigan mm -hmm. uh, Wisconsin impeachment is not a top five issue it's just not. I know it excites a Democratic base. I completely understand that. But yes. when you're thinking about a general election, you have to talk about things that are palatable to a more diverse voting bloc. And that's outside of the more extreme versions of the Democratic base. And I think candidates have to be mindful of that. Do you expect to see uh, any candidates grouping up together tonight? We've talked about this so much, right? Like, <laughs> will Bernie and Elizabeth Warren stick together? Will they go after Joe? Do you expect to see any groupings or any separations? Is it every man I, I for himself tonight, every I, woman for herself tonight? I don't think so. I think that I think Bernie and Elizabeth, they did that in the, or in the one debate. I don't think we're going to see that again. He's already come out um, and critiqued her Medicare for All mm -hmm. funding plan, right? So there is a point of contrast he can point to. Um, but for the most part, I think uh, that every candidate on this stage, I mean, they can make the case for themselves about why they're better than Donald Trump. What their job to do in this debate and every other is why they are better than the person standing next to them uh, to beat and take on, to beat Donald Trump and to take him on in the next election. And so that's their job. They need to show a level of toughness, also being able to speak to the individual issues. But I don't know that impeachment, even though it doesn't track in the Polling is, is so amorphous to me. Polling is like a snapshot in a moment in time. Mm -hmm. I mean, what people think about impeachment based on the poll you just cited, it's different right now as we sit here because we just sat through a day-long hearing where you had Trump appointees say, yes, he did the crime. And so all of those numbers may change, right? You know, I think that the, the televised hearings are very unpredictable in terms of mm -hmm. what people are going to say to pollsters in terms of polling about whether they support or don't support impeachment or whether it's important to them. Overall, though, I think the future of our democracy and the integrity of the next election is mo the most important thing. And that's tied in directly to this impeachment hearing because Donald Trump was trying to cheat in the next election if you're taking the Democratic argument, uh, you know, sort to, to its fruition, he was trying to interfere in the next election. And so this impeachment is basically to say, stop, because if you didn't start this process, he would continue to cheat all the way through the next election. It and there starts would be in the no House, it will end in the House because the Senate won't do anything about it. Guys, I hate to wrap. I loved having you here today. Thank you so much for your thoughts. You can see the candidates are lining up. Thank you, Zerlina, Shermichael, and Jackie, and to all of our other guests this hour. Stick with us right now for the MSNBC Washington Post Democratic debate coming up.